Uh, next up is Mr. Hyde, who is our band director at Muscatine High School. He has special guest with him, Odie Orr. It might be said that I pressed Mr. Hyde to get a little pre-information about tonight's meeting and I got nothing. So. <laughs> That's normal. <laughs> We're all anxious um, to hear what we're in for. Oh, and I'm a little scared. It looks like we might have all just received an assessment. <laughs> an assignment. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm a little taller, I guess. Uh, good evening, Dr. Reby and members of the school board. Uh, many of you know me as the head director at Muscatine High School, the band department. I'm also the uh, fine arts department head now. I'm here tonight in an effort to uh, share some news and provide an opportunity for you to get to know the music department at, M at NMHS a little bit. The MHS music department has been busy this fall. We've had band camp in August, all state music camps, rehearsals, football games, and competitions. This past month, we help, helped start roughly 100 students on string instruments and 180 students on band instruments in fifth grade. That's uh, quite a lot of students, I must say. Uh, at MHS, we have over 180 students participating in the choirs, 122 students in the orchestras, and 150 students in the bands. That's actually the largest number of students in the band department since, I, since before I arrived at Muscatine. The marching band has competed at three competitions where they play second at Mount Pleasant, uh, fourth in Marion, and fifth at Cedar Rapids. Our drum majors won best in class 4A at Marion. We held our annual Muskie Marching Invitational this past Saturday when we brought 16 bands from Iowa and Illinois to compete. The upcoming, this upcoming Saturday, we will host the IHSMA State Marching Festival and have over 1,500 students from 18 bands perform throughout the day in our stadium. Uh, I encourage you to come watch us at 3.20 p.m. on Saturday. Uh, I believe, actually, the school board members have a special pass that allows you to get into state events. I'm not certain of that. You might know more than I do. Um, I know Dr. Reby does. Uh, we Will do I be asked to perform at all? <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't have to perform. Okay. <laughs> Just come, come and cheer for us. <laughs> um, we do hope to continue our very long tradition of Division I ratings in our, with our district. On Saturday, October 21st, the music department will travel to Washington, Iowa, where 50 members of our program will audition for top ensembles in the state of Iowa. The auditions are held at six sites throughout the state. Our site is in Washington. MHS will take eight students in orchestra, 22 students in the fr from the choir, and 20 students from the band. That's also one of the largest groups we've ever taken from the band. Our students have been preparing for this experience for months and re will represent our school and community incredibly well. Tonight we are going to present a mock audition so that you and the community might have a, be a better glimpse of what it takes for students to, go and to get into the Allstate band. Uh, the choir and orchestra auditions differ in what the students will perform, so their music is different, but their, uh, the stress and the level of music that they have to perform is just as demanding. Uh, for instance, the orchestra actually prepares the music that they'll perform at Allstate, the choir performs uh, auditions on the music they'll perform at Allstate, but they'll get a new piece when they arrive, if they've cho been chosen, and the students in the band department have to ch uh, prepare technical etudes and then they're given the music that they're actually going to perform on on the 21st if they're accepted. Oh. So they actually have double duty. They, ha they have to actually learn special pieces first to get set accepted, and then they get the music if they're accepted. Um, this is Odysseus Orr, and he is a junior at MHS. He will be auditioning on trumpet. I'm sure some of you probably figured that out. Uh, <laughs> like a job interview, in appearance and presentation are incredibly important in this process. So Odie will most likely wear a shirt and tie, 
on that Saturday morning, but I did give him permission to kind of be a little relaxed tonight. Mm -hmm. He is playing for a lot more judges tonight. <laughs> um, so the audition begins with Odie entering the room with an individual judge. Uh, in, a, in this case, we are the individual judges. Um, he will introduce himself, but the judge will not know where Odie is from. He's not allowed. Each school is identified on the, on the scorecard by a number only. And the number is assigned by the state, and only the office has the master list at the site. So the judges have no clue what numbers go with what schools. So these numbers, can't, you can't look at them and go, oh, well, this tells you that this school is this, this number. They're completely random. You don't know what they mean. It's just a number. So he is only allowed to walk in he's, and say his name. He's not actually supposed to say his grade, where he's from. They're, he's also not supposed to have anything on him that identifies him as Muscatine. I, in fact, do encourage them not to wear purple and gold because we don't want to be identified as a specific school. They actually will check every piece of uh, paper that they walk in with. You notice he does have music on the stand. And they don't want to see any names of schools on there, so they will actually refuse to allow him to take his stuff in if Mar Muscatine's written on any of it so that the students are kept anonymous. Uh, the orchestra actually is performed blind, so the judge doesn't get to see the student at all. In the case of the, the band students, they do speak to the, to the uh, judge. So they'll come in, the judge will welcome them into the room, and the student will introduce themselves and perform a selection of a solo they have chosen <coughs> for the audition to kind of demonstrate their abilities. You face me. So as Odie plays, the judge will mark a ballot that is almost identical to the ones that you, I've handed to you. These ballots are yours to mark on if you would like tonight. You are welcome to complete the ballot as, we've, as we go through this. The next step is to perform a section of an etude. Odie has two etudes, he must know. Some instruments, such as the French horn and percussion, will have a lot more music that they have to prepare. Uh, the French horn has three etudes. The percussion has to be able to play three different instruments on the etudes that are written specifically for them. The students will be told what the cuts are at 5 a.m. on October 21st, and that's the same for all of the uh, sections, cl uh, choir and orchestra as well. Odie and I chose the cuts for tonight in advance to save for time, so Odie will now play his excerpt from the fast etude. Truthfully, the uh, judge actually will talk very little, so it can be very unnerving for the student. Next, Odie will play the slow etude, we so, uh, slow section.
The students must also know all their major scales and the chromatic scale. The major scales must be performed at a quarter note equals 88 beats per minute and 16th notes, either slurred up and tongued down or tongued up and slurred down. The judge will give the tempo and Odio has to remember the tempo to play his scales. He only plays three, but he must know all of them. Six of you have a card in front of you. In order for a performer to know which scales to play, he must choose a card that will tell them, tell them which two scales they are required to perform in their audition. The six scale cards you have are exactly like the cards Odie will choose from the, on the 21st. Odie, who's going to turn over a card for you? Okay, Mr. Bauer, would you please read your two scales for us? E and B flat. Okay. Odie gets to pick a scale not listed on the card to play first, the fo followed by the two scales on the card. Odie, which scale will you choose to play? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, <coughs> so Odie's going to play F, E, and B flat. Which one are you going to play first? scale is the last thing Odie will perform. It must be a minimum of quarter note equals 88 in 16th notes, but can be as fast as he wishes to go and in any articulation. Here's the tempo again. to tell you this is probably the hardest thing I'm asking a student to do and he just did this for all of you this is uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I can feel for him it scares it scares the living daylights out of me to have to do that sometimes and <laughs> he's under the pressure tonight so as you can see our students who are representing us on the 21st have a lot they must be prepared to do well under a lot of pressure their entire the entire decision is based on five minutes what you saw very little talking and that's how it's determined about whether or not they're in the Allstate ensembles. And that's the same for all of them. Once they've done the performance, they wait in the morning. Uh, many of the, the uh, judges will call back for a second time. They'll, there'll be 64 trumpets, for instance, trying out for, I think, 16 spots. So they will probably narrow it to about 24 and listen to 24 of them a second time and then choose the final 16. So, and it's the same for all of the instruments and all of the voices, that they have to narrow it from a very large number. Uh, I think the best, uh, best group is like 16 bassoons and they're t willing to take eight. So if you're a bassoonist and you're really good, you've probably got a good shot. Which we, uh, no we aren't, yes, we're sending Phil Smith on, on bassoon. Uh, anyway, I'm certain our students will represent us well and I hope that the, we will be back in November we had to share some good news about who was accepted to the Allstate ensembles. Maybe one of them could be Odie. Lastly, I'd like to invite you to our concerts. The orchestra was tonight, so sadly you can't go to that one, I'm sorry. But the choir will have a concert next Monday, October 16th, in the auditorium, and the band will have their October Spooktacular on Tuesday the 17th in the NHS auditorium. Uh, thank you for allowing us to share what's been taking place in the music department so far this year. Odie, I have a question for you. How many hours will you spend preparing for Allstate? Well, I practice about two hours a day. Um, 
Okay. So yeah. 80 hours to uh, audition for five minutes, which is amazing. It's a lot of time. I guess I should speak over here. If you have a bad job interview and it's just you're not not your day, you that's the way the cookie mm -hmm. crumbles. Mm -hmm. So they are very much under stress for that performance and trying very hard to meet a certain level, and so in some ways hoping that somebody else cracks under the pressure and not them. They're they're really great kids. They're really trying hard. Uh, you know, the, there was a question. That, Somebody asked, uh, maybe it was me this morning, why are you doing this, Odie? Odie, well, you were probably really motivated when I sat in on a pep band <laughs> last year. <laughs> that probably really, that probably drove you to, you know, try a little bit harder. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I thought that probably was the case. I, I do want to say that this really fits that target of developing leaders um, because um, this is what it's about working hard to get better um, and putting yourself out there and uh, we just really appreciate not only what you're doing but what you're doing and all the kids uh, in between so thank you thank you uh, we do hope we'll be seeing you at another pet band right Yes, I've been, uh, I've been, my, my lip is almost healed, so I think I can, I think I can We're looking forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Odie, good job. luck. Good luck. Scott, the screensaver's on. I don't know if yeah. Screen right there. So okay. I think we are live, um, is my understanding, and so I'm going to back up just for a minute. Our confidence monitor is not on, but uh, mm -hmm. word on the street, so to speak, is that we are live. So um, this would be the October 9th board meeting uh, of the Muscatine Community School District. We had a few technical difficulties to get started, but we are on track now. So we're glad that you um, have joined us. Next on our agenda um, is some information about our partnership with the Muscatine Community Foundation. And I'm gonna let Jerry make those introductions. Well, we are really uh, excited about this new partnership that the um, uh, Muscatine Area Foundation will be uh, working with our school foundation for uh, development and distribution of scholarships. And tonight, uh, Judy Holthorpe and, and uh, Shelley Meharry are here to, to talk a little bit about that. And, this really is going to be a good thing, not only for our, our kids in our school, but I think for the entire community. So, Shelly, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Evie. So I have to say I've given a number of professional presentations, but never before have I followed a trumpet solo. <laughs> so that was really, uh, really incredible uh, to see. Well, um, again, I'm Shelly Meharry, and I'm joined by uh, the executive director of the Community Foundation of Greater Muscatine, Judy Holdorf. We are delighted to share information about our new formed partnership between the Community Foundation of Greater Muscatine and the Muscatine Community Schools Foundation, um, specifically partnering together to enhance the scholarship opportunities that we have for students of Muscatine. So in August of this year, the Muscatine Community School Foundation began to transfer assets to the Community Foundation for Management. And we anticipate that the final migration of these funds will be completed at the end of October. So the Community Foundation of Greater Muscatine will then hold all the assets that are associated with the community of the Muscatine Community School Foundation and assume responsibility for their investment uh, under the direction of our investment committee. So the first question might be, well, what will the Muscatine School Foundation be doing then if the assets are being transferred and we're helping? You know, really, we think it's a wonderful partnership. We're able to provide our expertise on the back end of managing scholarships and doing the very best job for, for students and also managing those funds while the school foundation is able to focus on strategic plans, growing our scholarship program, and increasing opportunities for all of our students. So we think it's a really excellent uh, opportunity for partnership. The investment committee of the Community Foundation of Greater Muscatine is made up of um, financial professionals and volunteers in our community who really 
uh, do an excellent job at providing um, investment guidance on behalf of the Community Foundation. Our investment chair is Mel McMains. Uh, we also have Scott Inkstead, Bob Sheets, Gary Slight, Jim Stein, Rick Smith, and Michael Wilson on the investment committee. They direct um, the action of staff of the Community Foundation of how assets are invested. So the services that we will be providing at the Community Foundation is again asset management and the processing of all the scholarship payments that happen. <coughs> We'll be creating unique account files for all 58 scholarship funds which make up the Muscatine Community School Foundation. Did you know there were 58 unique scholarship funds that made up the foundation? We're really excited about the partnership. Um, we'll be processing all gifts to existing funds. Uh, that includes sending the tax deductible thank you letters for donors, uh, keeping them engaged and encouraging more gifts to scholarship funds. We'll be advising existing donors about the status of their fund, um, sharing information about interest earned, how our investment performance is, as well as the scholarship payments that are being made on behalf of their scholarship fund. And we would love to be able to assist new donors with creating their own scholarship funds. We will also be assisting scholarship recipients in how to claim their award. Um, some standard services that we provide uh, on behalf of the school foundation with the administration of the scholarship is verifying enrollment and credit hour verification. Uh, we send payment directly to the college or university, so payments never sent directly to a student. It goes right um, to their college or university. And we're also able to process renewable scholarships, which are the wonderful scholarships that provide multi-year support to a student. So in between semesters, we'll again verify enrollment, we verify academic good standing, and also in some cases, uh, we might be looking for degree-specific coursework. So if a student received a scholarship for, uh, for nursing, we would want to ensure that they're enrolled in a nursing program. So over the past few months, we've been working together with the high school guidance department. And through that work, there are actually 96 unique scholarships that they manage with our students. And it's, it's a great amount of work. They are a well-oiled machine. And when we had the opportunity to uh, engage with them uh, with a number of scholarships that we already managed, um, I got to learn a little bit more about the process. And if anyone has had a student who uh, either recently graduated, Tammy, I'm looking at you because I, I know that you are. Um, the process has been that students would complete one common application form and then for however many scholarships they wanted to apply for, that application was photocopied many, many times and then put into piles and that was how the process worked. So uh, it took a great amount of diligent secretarial support to get the piles right, to know who was, who was applying for which scholarships. And so I came in asking, this is a great amount of work. How are you keeping all this organized? And uh, got you know, a little bit more information and they were not utilizing an online kind of scholarship management process. Uh, so as we developed our partnership together, uh, we were able at the Community Foundation to secure a donor's funding to take the scholarship uh, application process for our students from paper form to digital. And so we are engaged with a vendor now called Community Force, who is um, an excellent resource not only at providing scholarship management but for but also grants management for large organizations as well. So right now the scholarship uh, management, the scholarship application portal is being built right now. And so we anticipate it going live January 1st. We would love to see students come back from the from their winter break to the new semester, uh, ready to learn about the uh, application, to uh, be ready to start completing their information um, to apply for scholarships. So students will be very familiar. Uh, they'll 
create a username and password and sign into the system. It is created like apps. So each section of information is like a little app. So when they complete their demographic information, it'll be marked as complete. And so visually, they'll be able to see how they're progressing through the application process. So students will complete a common application form. They'll be able to upload essays and letters of recommendation. And we feel that the site will really be able to help um, the school counseling department um, find some efficiencies because it will be going um, to paper, paperless, so the act of copying and things won't be, uh, won't be necessary. So the high school guidance department will continue to oversee the scholarship selection process and coordinating the committees. We really feel that that group is the best group that knows the students, knows the process in selecting, and so um, it won't be an external group that um, would be making the selection of scholarships. We would continue to have that process be the same. And our goal is to have every student learn how to use the Community Force um, software to encourage as many students as possible to uh, apply for scholarships. And we have additional support that can help that effort, uh, obviously through the guidance counselors, but also there's a college and career counselor now at the high school, plus there'll be an AmeriCorps VISTA who's also trained um, at encouraging students to apply. Um, so our overall goal is to secure, um, to grow our scholarship program so that one day every MHS student who graduates has the ability to receive a scholarship. And I think that ties ni nicely into our goal of wanting to have students who are graduating with post-secondary plans. So we're, exciting, we're excited to announce um, that we'll be having a partnership um, reception on Monday, October 23rd at 5 p.m. at the Howe Commons at the high school. I understand there's a board work session at 6 p.m. that evening, so uh, hopefully it could tie nicely into your schedules already. But we will be having the Community Foundation Board of Directors, our investment committee. Uh, we'll be inviting uh, donors uh, to scholarship funds that we are already familiar with, plus um, existing um, donors of the Community Foundation. Uh, everyone that we could think of to get together to celebrate the partnership, but also answer questions. Um, for many of the donors to scholarships, these have been established for a long time, and they're familiar with the scholarship being at the Muscatine School Foundation. We want to have the opportunity to answer any questions and get have donors be able to know us and to learn more about our scholarship management process. Um, we want to take very good care of the donors and make sure that all of their needs, needs and information is up. Uh, being met. So if any of you uh, hear of anyone who is interested in starting a scholarship fund, uh, you know where to send them to us at the Community Foundation. Uh, likewise, if anyone has any questions about the transition or how existing scholarship funds will be handled or managed, we'll be helping to field all those questions. So send them our way. Uh, again, it is such an honor for us to be able to handle um, the scholarships and asset management on behalf of the Muscatine Community School Foundation. Um, it's an it's a impressive legacy that's been providing support to students for a very long time, and we are really honored to be able to continue that work. So thank you very much for your trust. Any questions? Well, we are really looking forward to the, the partnership, and it, it, it really, like I, I said the other day, we take seriously the community part of Muscatine Community Schools, and uh, we want to be part of um, this, uh, this great community any and every way we can. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't wait to see the online process, because when you are the parent who is sat up at the kitchen table, <laughs> sweating bullets the night before when they're finishing paperwork and that'll be fabulous and it, it'll make it easier for our students yeah. as well so 
My, my hope with the online is that, you know, the current process is the applications are given out like February 14th, and then the students have approximately four weeks to six weeks to complete the application and turn it in. Once we have the system up and live, it's available all the time. So if it took a student longer to input their information, or maybe a parent the parents don't live together and so a student has to get information from uh, multiple households because it's open all the time I think we'll we, we can start having the conversation with seniors about scholarships at the beginning of the year versus nearing the tail end of the year so we're really excited thank, thank you, you. next on our agenda is a discussion around early retirement well uh, about this time of the year, we start to look forward to uh, budget issues and, and, uh, and getting ready for that February work. And uh, I'm anticipating that we will probably see a uh, need to, uh, I'm kind of assuming we probably will need to reduce our, our expenditures by about a million dollars next year. And so we are looking at ways we can do that uh, and still maintain our, our programs and our, our, our uh, 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 class sizes at, at uh, places that uh, we've come accustomed to. So we're, we have to start looking at some creative ways to do that. Last year we did offer the uh, uh, early retirement option. We had, and we saved about two, a little over $220,000 in general fund expenditures. And so our, you know, my goal would be that hopefully we would be able to be around that quarter of a million dollars next year that we could uh, save general fund expenditures if we, if the board so chose to offer the early retirement. Um, the in your board packet is a copy of last year's plan. Uh, and um, again, we would be looking at wanting folks uh, to let us know by January, I think January 5th next year. That allows, uh, allows us a, a sufficient time to determine what positions would not need to be filled if there's some uh, changing of assignments that would uh, that would uh, uh, make for more efficient budgeting uh, and gives us time to work through uh, a process um, last year we did make that available for both certified and classified employees and we had some of of each i think there were about 15 uh, employees um, obviously, when you offer that, it also uh, affects your retention rate because some folks decide to leave. Um, the advantage for us is that we can manage our workforce size without having to go through layoffs. Uh, and there's really, I always think, two downsides to layoffs. Uh, well, one, it's just it's it's devastating for folks. But um, you know, you you get into a situation where you're paying some unemployment insurance. Uh, and you're also typically um, losing workers that uh, are your um, uh, lowest compensated workers. And so uh, if you offer an early incentive, uh, early retirement incentive, uh, you tend to, uh, you capture some workers uh, that are uh, higher paid personnel, which then makes more room on your, um, in your budget. So uh, I thought this month would be, it would be good to put that out there as a discussion item. Uh, like I said, I, I just gave uh, a, a copy in the, of the, in the book of last year's plan. There's um, nothing set in stone as to what that would need to look like, um, but it was uh, for your information about where we were at last year with, with that. Jerry, do the changes to chapter 20 impact what we're able to do or not do? Um, not for teachers, no, because we're still under contract there. Um, and, and again, really, um, you know, you, even if you were, if you had the capacity to say, well, we could, we can just lay off folks, uh, again, um, it, it, that's probably going to make a difference in your capacity to go out and get new hires mm -hmm. because uh, do, people aren't looking for long-term employment in places that are laying, laying people off. We've been very fortunate here. Uh, we've closed a building, uh, we've reduced our staff, uh, we reduced our expenditures, and we have not had to really resort to um, um, substantial layoffs with people. And I think that's, that's good for our system, it's good for the community, um, but we do have to be on top of this and manage our employment force. Because, um, you know, one of our 
one of our targets is we'd like to be about 80% of our budget personnel. We're probably about 85% now. Uh, so we have to continue to, to work on that goal. Chair, you mentioned the million dollars next year. This was, there was about a quarter million last year and a quarter million you expect this year, give or take. Does that mean there's another half a million or another three quarters of a million? That you're looking yeah, for? Uh, and we're looking at some different ways of, of generating some space on the budget. About a quarter of a, if we do about a quarter of a million, if we'd save about a quarter of a million on, uh, on this uh, enhanced separation, uh, we also are taking a look at uh, changing uh, on the uh, teacher uh, leadership uh, TLC monies. We currently are paying the costs of the replacement teachers as opposed to the teachers that are in the coaching positions. If we flip that, our, your higher compensated folks would come out of the general fund and go into the categorical fund, which would also save us maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, so then, uh, you know, obviously, you know, it, you know, a half a million dollars is, is a lot of money, but uh, we're we're confident we can we can make some additional adjustments, uh, and again, keep the program whole because, you know, we're we're making such good progress. It uh, we want to make sure that we maintain our financial security. You know, we could say, well, we'll just use some of that cash reserve. We'll just use some of that unspent budget authority. Once it's gone, it's very hard to get it back. And that really is intended for emergency situations. I think at this point we're still, it's, it's a management issue that we need to find uh, solutions for. So, um, and, and the, the million dollars is just kind of a, a guesstimate based on what enrollment may be. And, and we know that there's probably going, you know, uh, be very little increase, if any increase in state funding. Um, so we need to we need to prepare for that, and we need to we need to start that work now, so we're not in a in a crisis mode in March when we're trying to figure out the budget. I'd like to be on, in front of that curve, so we're we're uh, we're dictating what direction we can go. I know we talked about it before, but what about the attrition that happens towards the end of the year? Do you have an idea of what impact that had last year, or what it could have going forward? I know it's not typically as much, but yeah, do you have an idea. Of that? You know, typically. Uh, about 10% is what you would expect of a, in turnover. Um, and so that again will be part of that as uh, what we'd want to take a look at is uh, positions that we would not maybe necessarily re replace or how we would uh, uh, do those a little more creatively. Um, I just didn't know if that factored into the dollar amounts or not. It, it doesn't factor into that savings amount. It would be on top of that amount. And this is for certified and uncertified. Yes, it'd be. I I would recommend we we would do both. Um, now there is one where chapter the changes in in the, uh, the uh, chapter twenty may or may not make a difference. But I think it's you know we have we have um, we've had very loyal committed workers. I think that we want to make sure that we do our best to um, respect that loyalty. Um, and so if we can, if the, we can find a way to um, uh, manage that workforce as we do with our certified folks, I think that will be, I think that will speak well for the district. Since it's for discussion, were there any comments last year when this was offered that if it was a little this way or a little that way, it would have made a difference? Yes, yeah, so that's a really, that's a good uh, question. And, and, you know, there's always some folks, oh, I'm just a... I'm only a year away. Couldn't you make? You know, couldn't you? Couldn't you change it? There's always going to need to be a cutoff, and whenever you have that, somebody is going to be on the wrong side of it. Um, you know, I think there's. Um, I think it's a. I think it's an, an adequate plan. I think it's a generous offer uh, that we've that we've put out there in the past. Um, I don't think it's necessarily so much if it were an enhanced. Uh, uh, compensation. I think for a lot of folks, it really is a, hard, a tough decision if they're going to give up their career. And um, and it, it uh, every year we have people that really struggle with this. Uh, and we, um, you know, we we try and give them as much support and information we can. But it comes down to, it's uh, something they have to sit down with their families and with their financial folks and see if it works for them. 
But Jerry, overall, are you predicting almost the same number as last year? If I were to guess, I think it might be a little higher than last year. Um, you know, I think um, I think some of the collective bargaining changes has probably caused some folks to feel have some uneasiness about well, what's the future going to bring? I think that may affect the, that a little bit. Uh, we also, you know, just did a rough calculation on potential. We have about 80 people that might be in that category. So there's a there's a lot of a lot of folks that um, that might be able to take advantage of that. So, um, we, and we will uh, try and have more of that specific information in November. Um, that I, I, I always think it's good for us to have a chance to have a little bit of a discussion about before it comes to the table for possible action. Since you brought up the 80, is there a risk that too many? Do well, it? there yes, there's always a risk that too many from the standpoint of um, we are in the, uh, the state is in a spot of a worker shortage and particularly a teacher shortage. And so um, that is that is another. If, if we would have too many, they, they, it's getting harder to fill teaching positions. Um, and that's the other side of this. That if we can manage our our workforce this way, um, I think we have a lot of really positive things we can do in recruiting people here. And I want to make sure that we really can maximize that recruiting effort because I've, I've said people would be really foolish not to take a job here. So the plan would be we would see this again next month with uh, with the uh, with the updated plan um, and if if any board members have any suggestions or thoughts about the plan or specifics on that uh, if you would uh, uh, get those to Lisa we can certainly uh, make sure that that's um, you know brought forward for the board to consider. Um, so if the, and if that's brought forward at the November meeting, you would be looking for action at that point in time. Yeah, one of the one of the things that we do have, uh, uh, if we want to make January fifth the time, the, it, by law you uh, need to give folks forty five days to consider that. So that's we would we would need to um, we would probably need action at that point. It could maybe go well. We don't have a second meeting in November, so it would need to be action would need to be taken then if we wanted that January 5th deadline and that is completely selfish from the standpoint of that gives us well, uh, additional lead time going into the budget work but that is one of the reasons why we do this is that so it is it is a way to do uh, planning and um, in uh, in management so it also gives people then time through the holidays if they want to talk with family members or to get yeah. some other financial planning assistance. It's a it's a good time to do that as well, right? It is, um, and and it is. I have not met anyone that has made this decision lightly. They really do, they really do agonize over it, and um, and that's. But then that speaks to the kind of people we have working for us. They're really committed to to our kids and our system. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay, thank you for that. Next on our agenda is the second reading on the following policies, and I'm gonna read through these. Um, again, some of these are new. Some of these are scheduled for deletion. It does not mean that the policy is not important. It does mean it's covered somewhere else, or it may be a duplication of a policy. So I'll read through these. 401.15 is personnel records. That's actually moving from the 700 series from 705.3. 803, uh, 803 is disposal of school equipment. 805, crisis management and response planning. 806.1, buildings and sites long range planning. That's new. 806.2, building and sites surveys, new. 806.3, educational specifications for building and sites, new. 806.4, site acquisition, new. 807.1, maintenance schedule, new. 807.2, requests for improvement, new. 807.3, emergency repairs, new. 807.4, buildings and site uh, adaption for persons with disabilities, new. 
807.5, vandalism, new. 807.6, energy conservation, new. 808, lease, sale, or disposal of school buildings and sites, new. 900.1, tobacco, nicotine, free environment, that's a deletion. 900.2, releases to news media, internal unit news. 900.5, visitation by students, adults, groups, or agencies to the Muscatine Community School District. 900.10, news conferences and interviews, new. 900.11, live broadcasts or videotaping, new. 900.13, advertising and promoting, new. Are there any comments that the board has on that set of policies? Lisa, have you received any? I have not. Comments, all right. So if you have anything else or questions around those, if you get those to Lisa, otherwise we'll see those at the next meeting for their um, third and final reading. Next on the agenda is our July, August, and September financials. Okay, <clears throat> presented tonight is actually July and August, and in the board book, page 115 is, it's our, the treasurer's report, but I expanded it somewhat to give um, kind of a month by month look at revenues and expenditures. And so it just pretty simple, starts off with our beginning cash balance, revenues, expenditures, and then the cash that hits the balance sheet. And <clears throat> what I mean by that is, uh, you know, not all cash we get is revenue or expend would be an expenditure specifically in July in the general fund, three, about $3 million was uh, expended and it hit the balance sheet because we had accrued all those expenses from July and August that were really for last fiscal year. So <clears throat> that's what the reduction in a balance sheet amount is. So, and then our ending cash balance for July 31st. And I'll just point out then in the management fund where that early retirement is paid, in July, we make that first quarterly payment, which was around 178,000 this last July. And the, the rest was our workers comp for 17, 18. So we kind of, if you remember, we look when we're in that budget season and looking at our management fund, we kind of look out to the next year also, because you know we wanna have that cash in our bank July 1st to cover those immediate expenditures for early retirement, but more importantly, our property casualty and workers' comp. And then I'll also point out that in our agency fund, um, that's really more of a timing issue there because those early retirement insurance payments that we're making for those early retirees, on July 20th, we make that payment to the health savings account. And so because then we have to request the money f um, to pay for the insurance from the health savings account. And so there's just a timing issue. That's why that agency fund is negative at the end of July. But in a perfect world, it would just be zero at the end of every month because that's what the agency fund does is we're just paying insurance for those people on early retirement. And then I also, uh, presenting August, um, and depending on the, I know, I know things have changed a lot in this last year, reports and whatnot, and, and the way we're doing things in the finance department, uh, when the first of the month falls on a Monday, it becomes kind of time crunch to get those prior month board reports done and accurate, as accurate as they can be at that time. So that's why only July and August are being presented. And then I'd just point out on August about, uh, that's when we make that big property casualty payment of 246,000. So, you know, management's fund sitting at 212,000. We still have to, we will be getting our property taxes here in <clears throat> October and uh, April. So, you know, we've pretty much, except for those quarterly retirement payments, we've pretty much made our management fund expenditures. Uh, and I have no other comments on the treasurer report unless the board has any questions on the treasurer's report. 
So the next document is uh, a look at our unspent authorized budget. I put FY16 and I'm still putting estimated 17. You know, nothing is going to be final until the DE says it's final, which won't be until probably February or so. But um, everything there in blue is is the is formula driven. Everything in kind of the peach color has already happened. What's in yellow there are estimates. So for fiscal 18, several estimates are in there of in of spending authority based on prior years. And I put um, line 33, our estimated expenditures, and, and really that's just an estimate to keep our unspent authorized budget at the same level it is in fiscal 17. But now, this month, last month, we're starting to be, we're beginning to build that line item budget. So. By this time next month, or for sure in November, we'll have, um, you know, I don't know what percentage we have done, but obviously we know salaries and benefits, and so we just got to get those built, put them in the, the right accounts, and, and um, we'll know where we're at for fiscal 18, and then obviously estimating our miscellaneous income <clears throat> for uh, fiscal year 18. So. All right, and then, so starting on page 118, so in the past, uh, or this past year, we've been working a lot with our finance system to try to utilize it more efficiently, and one of those ways is with the activity fund. Um, usually we just kind of get reports off of our finance system and plug them into an Excel spreadsheet, and that's actually what has been presented to you guys. So. Uh, we had to change some of our chart of accounts in order for to utilize our finance system in that. So that happened July 1st. So these reports are actually printed off our finance system and pretty much looks the same as it did on the Excel format. So what's good about these is, um, you know, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know that say activity sponsors would go to the board book to find out how much is in their <laughs> account. So mm -hmm. next steps are being able to, now that we have this on our finance system, we can you know get reports out to those <coughs> sponsors and athletic director and, and high school principal and such. So, um, so now it becomes just a two page report we get off and we'll be presenting that for the activity fund. And then the last page, uh, 122, is just a report you've seen in the past, school nutrition and just reporting, uh, comparing, you know, meal meals served uh, and comparing that to last year. So it's just a trend analysis and then, you know, we'll get September and October plugged in there for next month, so. That's it. What questions do you have for Tom? All right, Tom, thank you very yeah. much. I just have some announcements and reminders before we adjourn, so some things that are coming up. Um, if you joined us about halfway through the meeting, we did have some technical difficulties. So the first portion of the meeting you'll be able to find on our district website in the next day or two. If you'll give us a couple of days, we'll make sure that we have that up. So if you're anxious to see what you missed, um, head out to our district website to find that. Things that we have coming up in the district, October 23rd through the 26th will be parent-teacher conferences. October 23rd is the Joint Foundation Partnership Signing Ceremony. That'll be at 5 p.m. and it'll be in the Stanhouse Student Commons. So come join us for that. And then you can stick around and at six o'clock the board will have a work session. Um, we'll actually be, uh, we'll be at MHS but we'll be in the library that evening. October 26th there'll be a two hour early dismissal for parent-teacher conferences. 
October 27th is a no school day. That is a parent-teacher conference comp day for our staff. And October 30th is a teacher in service and there's no school that day as well. Are there any other announcements for the good of the cause? ISB meeting tomorrow night, Mount Pleasant and then the state convention in uh, November 17th, I believe, that so week. There's three of us that are gonna go head down to Mount Pleasant tomorrow evening for um, a um, continuing learning education opportunity through the Iowa Association of School Boards, and yeah, then their, um, then their state conference will be middle of November. Right. And there's still time to sign up for that if board members would like to sign up, so let Lisa know. Anything else? I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. And is there a second? Second. And all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? <laughs> and the motion carries. Aye. Thank you very much. I had to jump on it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got it now. You're, you're